Hello, 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 and welcome to this month's amazing lineup on the Her Version Impact panel. We have had over 200 female guest speakers. We just hit the 200 mark on our stage up to this point. We have over 520 YouTube videos, over 145 audio podcasts, over 675 members in our face group boot. Uh, group. Be sure to join us. Um, so this topic, this month's topic is awesome. We do not get a handbook for raising our children. And we also don't get a handbook for releasing our children into the wild. One minute you have a little five-year-old skipping around the house. And then 15 seconds later, you turn around and that five-year-old is a 20-year-old. At least that's my experience. <laughs> and suddenly the rules change. We have moms on the panel today sharing their expertise and experience on transitioning from the mom role to the support role. We will be covering an array of topics today, such as when to stop rescuing and start fostering independence, how to encourage self-advocacy skills, how to teach a young adult money management skills, how to own your failure to launch, setting up new boundaries and setting expectations for house expectations if your adult child lives with you. So I'm thrilled to have a female panel filled this month as we talk candidly about parents who suddenly have an adult child in their presence and how to navigate that. Here at Her Aversion, we are taking the steps needed to create environments where we can speak authentically about our truth on topics that can be a little hard to talk about. Join us as we dive deep into these ladies' personal journeys. There will be live QA for two hours. So if you are catching up live with us right now and jumping on, I appreciate you being here. We will be live for two hours and you um, can ask questions, give opinions. Um, Hang out with us in the comment section and possibly your question and or comment can come up on screen for us to um, have an opinion about, I guess. For those of you that don't know me, I am your host, Sabrina Victoria. If you are new to this podcast, uh, make sure you follow, like, subscribe, and share. Let's jump right in. Hello and welcome. I would love to take some time before we actually jump into these juicy questions to kind of go around the room. I would love for each of my ladies to introduce themselves. The questions that I love to ask is who you are, where you're from, what you do, and why you decided to speak on this subject. And I would love to start with Maureen. Hello. That music makes me dance every time. It just like gets you pumped, doesn't it? I am Maureen Scanlon. I am from Phoenix, Arizona. I am a little under the weather, so if I have a coughing fit, forgive me. As you saw, my assistant just brought me some water. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm a certified life coach, an award-winning author, a relationship expert, a podcast host of I Never Knew, and thank you, love. You are my inspiration for starting that podcast. I, love um, I am a recovered codependent and self-sabotager, and I have accreditation in many areas of psychology. I help others learn to take back their power, release limiting beliefs, and understand that your relationship with you is the single most important thing to living a life of joy. And I am the mother of three adult children, 32, 30, and 23, along with being a grandma. So thank you. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Maureen. Miss Sharman, who are you? Where are you from? What you do? And why this subject? You're on mute. Oh, do I have to unmute it? Here you go. Ah. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Charmin Johnson, and I'm in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. And I have five adult children, or four adult children, one 17. Um, eight, they'll be turning ages 29, 27, 24, and 20 this next month. <laughs> um, 
and I am um, not an expert on adult children. <laughs> so I'm on here hoping to um, learn uh, support and uh, get support from, you know, and know that I'm not alone in this journey because it's, it's a whole other, like, small children and small problems, adult children, adult problems. So I'm, I'm excited to be a part of um, this panel with all of you guys and hopefully learn something. Love it. Do you know that, did you know that you're the inspiration for this topic, Charmin? Did I tell you that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you because my son just turned 18. So like, hello, it came just in time for me because everything's changing on this end. So I get yeah. it. Um, Tana. Sorry, Tana. You're on mute, Tana. Let's see. Hang on. Hang on, girl. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm Tana McPherson-Smith. I'm from Milton Keynes in the UK and really pleased to be here. I'm a child and adolescent trauma therapist and I am a, um, a thought change transformation coach and I work really closely with children, teenagers and with their parents and teachers. And I was a teacher for 25 years before I came into this line of work when I ran a boarding house in a boarding school and we had 60 girls between the ages of 13 and 18 living with myself and my family. So uh, I've had quite a bit of experience of dealing with a lot of adolescents in my time. And my children are 32 and 27. And I have a grandson that I see all the time who is 20 months. Love so it. Thank delighted you. to be here. Thank you. I love it. Thank you, Tana. Uh, Brenda, who you are, where you're from, what you do and why this subject. Hi, everyone. My name is Brenda Borens. I am from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And I am a live event producer by trade. So I have had the opportunity to work on some of Canada's largest events. I specialize in production of sports championships that are broadcast to the world. So it's a really crazy, chaotic, fun career, but it taught me how to stay calm. And I think that's super important when I'm dealing with adult children. So I have two children. Uh, Brayden is 26 and Taya is 20. Thanks for letting me be here today. Yes, yes. I love it. Thank you so much, Brenda. Karen, who you are, where you're from, what you do, and why this subject? Hi, I'm Karen Cooper. I am from Staten Island, New York, and I am in the health and wellness industry. I'm an isogenic consultant, so I help women up-level their health, mind, and uh, finances. And my daughter is going to be 21 next month, and my son is 16, and I am beyond thrilled. Why this subject? Because nobody talks about it. Quite frankly, nobody says by the way when you send your kid off to college like what do you do or how do you feel and all those things so i'm like beyond excited to be talking about this topic today i love it thank you so much karen uh share our donita who you are where you're from what you do and why this subject hi howdy i'm donita i'm a fifth generation oklahoma panhandle pioneer so i'm out here on the prairie and i teach other people how to homestead and kind of live the simple life. I've got six children who I homeschooled from day one, and they're between the ages of 30 and 15. So we've been in the adulthood thing for quite a while. I uh, probably a little unique in my thought process because I don't allow teenagers in my house. They're either a child or a youth. Uh, and so it's like, I'm not dealing with the teenage years and that's worked out really well for me. Uh, I'm also an award-winning journalist and, uh, a faith midwife and I, I've just got several hats that I wear and I'm really excited to be here with people all over the world. This is cool. I love it. Thank you, Donita. And Miss Cheryl, who you are, where you're from, what you do and why this subject? Hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl Vargas. I'm the owner of Art Studio 928, and we're located in LaGrange, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. Um, we help to connect, engage, and delight corporate teams uh, through art. And I'm here today because I'm the mom of two wonderful 40-year-old uh, sons who have provided me with four beautiful grandchildren. And uh, yeah, I'm here because uh, I'm very interested in this too. I, I've never seen uh, a, a lot 
I, I don't see a lot of information out there about how to uh, transition into that stage of being an adult uh, parent. So uh, I'm here to learn and I'm also here to answer questions. If anyone uh, has questions about being a grandma, I'm getting good it. at it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Cheryl, for uh, hanging out with us. I'm ha so happy to have all of you here. For those of you that are uh, jumping on live, thank you for being here. We really appreciate you supporting us. We can all use some perspective in this area. So I encourage um, all of you listening uh, on the, in on this podcast to uh, comment and share uh, whenever you know you feel necessary. This is an interactive forum. So feel free to share, comment, or ask questions to have your questions pop up on screen. And our ladies will be more than happy to give advice based on their journey. I should have just read that right off the script. I don't know why I tried to go off script. I would love to start out by handing the floor over to Maureen uh, to reintroduce herself and ask her question. Lady Maureen. Thank you. Yes, lady. Hello. Okay. My question is kind of twofold, and you know how I am, Sabrina. I always have to make it light. So the first question I have for you ladies is, what was the profound moment where all of a sudden you looked at your adult child because they said something or did something, and you went, oh, my gosh, my kid's grown up now? Anybody? Good question. Brenda? Oh, you're muted. I apologize. After my injury, my daughter set up a GoFundMe page without our knowledge. And it completely caught me off guard that she had overheard my husband and I saying, well, we haven't heard back from the insurance yet. She was 18 at the time and she went and set up a GoFundMe page. And my son's girlfriend came over the next day of course this is during the height of the pandemic so it was only very small people that were allowed in your quarantine house and my brother or my son's girlfriend said isn't it amazing how much support and i said what are you talking about and i look over at my daughter and she just starts bawling and she's like don't be mad don't be mad and i'm like what i heard you and dad talking about insurance and i'm like so I, I set up a GoFundMe page. I'm not even on Facebook. Facebook's for old people. <laughs> like, they're on Instagram and Snapchat. And so she set up a GoFundMe page and it completely shocked me. And she said, you always taught me to have a contingency plan and my mom's getting an eyeball. Wow. <laughs> so it, I was so stunned that at 18 that she had that foresight because she didn't want us not to have, get the prosthetic eye because they're very expensive. So that to me was the turning point where I was like, I know you just turned 18, which is technically an adult in Canada, but wow, that was a really, a big move, a big player move in my world. It just really, really surprised me. So that's, that was the instance for me. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love those shifting of the baton. Mom took care of her. Now she's taking care of mom. I love those moments. Anyone else? Charmin, Tanya. So I've I love that story, and I, I can see that that was must have been an incredibly proud moment. I think for me there were two, and it shows the slight difference with my with my children. Um, my daughter, I, I was really ill for six months in 2013. I ended up in a psychiatric unit for six months, completely unexpectedly. And prior to that, my daughter had asked many times whether she could have a tattoo. And we'd said, no, absolutely not. It's a really big decision. You need to, we want you to be 18 until we know you can make that decision properly, knowing what all the implications are. And so she really patiently, she, we knew she was looking, but she didn't do anything about it. When I was in hospital, she had, she just turned 18. Um, I, I missed the birthday and everything. And she said, is it okay if I have a tattoo now? And I said, if you really need feel that that's what you need to do, then, you know, think about it. Let me know what you think you're going to put on it. And she came back and she'd drawn it. And she said, I just want it on my ribs, under my arm. I want it to say, to wish you were somebody else is to, the waste, is to waste the person you are. I am who I am. And knowing how difficult she had found things through school and um, 
everybody adored her, but she never felt that she quite fit in. She was on the outside looking in and all the friendship groups and things. That for her said so much that she just wanted to recognize for the, oh, I'm getting quite emotional, that actually I am who I am. So I really ask, oh, you know, yes, you are in a position to make your own decisions now about what you want to do with your life, uh, tattoos or otherwise. And on the other scale, my son, um, when he was probably about 17, he not long passed his driving test. And I didn't know anything about this, but a little while later I discovered when I was sorting out his car to take it into a garage for a service that there was a ticket in it that said that he had been on the Euro train, the Euro tunnel through with his car. And it's like, when and how did this happen? And so I just sort of said, is there something you ought to be telling me about this car journey that you've done? And he looked at me and said, this smile, like what car journey? I said, have you been to Paris in the car? And he went, I may have done. He said, that was something I was saving for my 21st birthday to say, there's something you don't know about me because we talked really openly about everything. And he had challenged with his friends to jump in his car, having not been driving for that long on his own and drive him and two or three friends in a very small car from London to Paris and round, round um, Paris and back again and try and get back in time for first lesson on a Saturday morning because we have Saturday lessons as well. And they got stuck on the ring road, went round twice apparently and got back in time for second lesson and I knew nothing about it. What was worse was when my older child, as in my husband, admitted many years later that he'd known about it all, all the way. He'd agreed that it was OK because he knew they would do it regardless. He would rather do it with all the safety measures in place. So there we go. That's my story. I love that. I love that. Anybody else? I've got one real quick before I have to run. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so real easy. When I uh, called my son one morning, um, he had gotten married. You know, he was living with his wife. And I said, what are you guys doing today? He said, well, first I'm making uh, breakfast for Jackie. And then um, we're going out shopping. And so that just blew my mind because the whole time he lived with me as my son, he never, he always said he couldn't cook a thing. He couldn't cook a thing. He couldn't clean, couldn't do any of this, these things. And also the other thing that will surprise you when you're, kids get uh, grown is that you'll come over to their house and everything that you told them that they should do, they're asking you to do. So don't come into their house until you take their, your shoes off. Okay. So little, little wonderful things like that. <laughs> Those were my signals that they were adults. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Karen, you had something. Yeah, I actually have a similar tattoo story. My daughter was asking for years, like, I mean, like, she was, like, 15 or 16, like, young, when she started asking for a tattoo. And she had a, you know, she had a rough go of it, you know, in her teen years here. And, um, you know, we were like, you know, wait till you're similar to you. We were like, wait till you're 18, wait till you're 18. And, like, right before she turned 18, because she's in August, she decided to get the tattoo. And I had no idea what she was going to get. And um, she ended up getting a small butterfly, like a butterfly almost like coming out of the cocoon because <clears throat> it was like it was like her growth. So she explained it to me. I didn't go with her. Uh, my husband went with her and it was like her growth. So it was like a small, medium, large butterfly. And it was all about her, her not feeling comfortable in her own skin, having anxiety and everything like that and how she's blossomed and bloomed and become who she is. It was, it was and it was and it's my most favorite. She has another tattoo, but that's my favorite one. Love that. It's funny how the stigma of tattoos has changed. They've become sort of these manifestation things where it's a reminder, you know, it's something on your body that's a reminder. So I love that. Charmin, do you have anything or Donita? There's so many. I <laughs> there's just so many things. My children are consistently surprising me just consistently. It's such an adventure. <laughs> yes. Yes. Charmin, do you have anything? I can't think of a specific story where I was like, oh, you're an adult. <laughs> you know, like it's, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm like trying to think of like a specific story where, you know, like it was that moment where I'm like, oh, you're, you know, you're such an adult. It, it's, more, it's, more like, 
<laughs> it's more like a journey, you know, like it's, it's do you have boys? My, my kids. I, I, I just because my husband is still not an adult. I, I, <laughs> you know, I have four boys and a girl, and so I feel like I'm trying to push them into being an adult. Like, like I'm telling them, you're you're an adult now. That's your responsibility, not mine. You know, like <laughs> love it. I think, uh, that, that was kind yeah. of. Um, I mean, there's my son just turned 18, so he literally just graduated high school like two months ago, but um, I mean, two of the biggest things that just recently happened probably about two weeks ago. So my son doesn't have a curfew. We've talked about kids before and I'm like very, I don't have rules. So um, my whole thing is just be respectful. Um, don't do anything that would cause me to create a rule and then we're good. So my son does not have, he comes and goes as he pleases and I've, uh, since he was probably 16, 17 years old, that's just the way that I've run it. And he's a really good kid. Um, I haven't had any issues with him. But anyways, so his girlfriend, he now has a girlfriend, which many of you know, because you've seen my posts. Um, she, they're back together again, by the way, for those of you that saw the breakup post, but they're back together. And she, um, she came over to the house at probably like 10 uh, with him together. And then I have a ring cameras. I have cameras all over the house. So um, I check them every morning just to like see what was going on. So at like 2.40 in the morning, they both leave the house with bags. Okay. So yes. <laughs> so I'm like, I go over there. I look outside. There's no car. It's like seven in the morning. I was like, and there's, there, he hasn't slept over yet. Like he always is back at home at night. So, or in the morning, no matter what time he gets home. So I check, you know, of course I check the, you know, whatever. And I don't reach out to him. And I could have reached out to him and been like, Mah. but I'm like, you know what? Let's just see what happens. So a whole day goes by nothing. So, you know, Maureen and I are both like crime, crime uh, freaks. Uh, we watch a lot of crime TV. So my head goes right to like, oh my gosh what 24 hours goes by no contact i finally snapchat him it, we always snapchat two hearts so i like snapchat two hearts he snapchat my back two hearts so i'm like okay that's a good sign like he's alive it's him for sure that's like our signal two days go by nothing three days go by i snap him again are you alive and he goes yes uh yes i'm alive laughing face and I'm like, how do you know, how do I know that this isn't a bad guy? And he snaps me back. We have a, um, a secret password. So like he, he messaged me back the secret password, laughy face. I'm like, what the hell was it? four days? He was gone for four days with his girlfriend. He comes back super chill, whatever. I like wander into the kitchen, wander into the kitchen, um, uh, you know, inquiring but not inquiring. And so, and his girlfriend was there and they basically just told me that like her brother got a hotel down in Miami and they were hanging out and just had like a really cool time with two other couples and hung out on the beach and got tan and ate and just chilled. But he didn't tell me anything. He just like left and I had to like sit here. And it actually reminded me of this one time when I traveled like three hours South to go see a boyfriend of mine when I was probably around the same age, 17, 18. My mom called me on my cell phone and she's like, Hey, where are you? You haven't been down. You haven't been home all day. And I told her I was in Champaign, Illinois, which if Cheryl was still here, she would know where that was. Uh, which is like three hours South from where I lived. I've never, I had never done anything like that. And I remember specifically this long pause, but I said it, my mom was like, so uncomfortable. <laughs> But like, what could she do? I was 18 years old. Like I was a, a legal person and I could do, I could do stuff. I was home by midnight, you know, cause I, we, I had a curfew and, uh, but I remember, and I'll never forget that. And then my son did this to me and I was like, oh my God, I get it. And he did it like 10 times worse. <laughs> oh, it comes around, doesn't it? It yes, comes yes, around. Yes. Oh so, my yeah. gosh. I love that. And also I was thinking as you were speaking, he just continued the dynamic you you set up. 
Yeah. Where you, you gave him freedom. You, yep. you didn't have a curfew. He could just yep. come and go. And, yep. and then all of a sudden we're like, dang, why was I that? <laughs> why was I allowing so much freedom? Now he's not going <laughs> to tell me anything. I mean, oh. Yeah. yeah. It was for good me, for him, though. I think it really helped him feel independent. Yeah, I, re- I really do. Like he, he when he was in the kitchen, he was he gave me a hug. You know, he was cooking food. My son cooks. He was cooking food and um, it was just super chill. They told me all about it and shared stories about birds and pictures and everything. So I like you know, they were totally open about it. And so it was really cool. We talked for like an hour, but. It was interesting just the dynamic of both of us having to like come to terms with this new thing. Well, mainly you. <laughs> I don't I don't think he ever come to terms with anything. <laughs> good boy. Good boy, good boy, good boy. All right, you know, Maureen. Well that go ahead. Go ahead. Can I real quick before we go to the next I just want to say this is something that just happened this week. My son um, struggles with panic attacks and anxiety. And when he was growing up, I got divorced when he was 10 months old. And it was always just me and him because his sisters were nine and seven years older than him. So, you know, it was just, he was always my little buddy. And he had oppositional defiance um, and ADHD. And so it was always just this, you know, butting of heads, butting of heads. Nothing I could say was meant anything. It was always lecturing, lecturing. And I realized the other day he called me and he, he said, mom, I need your cheerleading. I need your advice. And for the first time, it was like, oh, he's asking for my input. You know, like this is the moment he's 23. Like he recognizes he needs me. And what I say is valuable where he crossed that threshold of, you know, the the teenager doesn't want to hear anything that mom has to say. So that was a cool moment. And Mm -hmm. he got off the phone and felt really good. And, you know, thank you. Thank you, mom. I love you. You always make me feel better. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Thank you, Marina, for uh, storytelling. For storytelling. That was great. Fits right in with our topic or with our um, podcast here. So thank you. Um, Ms. Sharman Johnson, take the stage. What's your question? Um, <clears throat> my question is more of, so I have the more um relax when they were teenagers like those were all learning things like I would um try try to teach them like money management and and um look for opportunities to 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 do that and then when they're you know and they're at as like something would come up and a lot of times like the boys would be like you know I don't I know what I'm doing I don't you know like as they got into that, like where you're on a pedestal, mom knows everything and, and to where mom doesn't know anything anymore. I, you know, and I would hear like, you know, you didn't graduate from college or some, you know, stuff like that. So then as an adult, as adults recently, which, which started this for this, um, this podcast or this, uh, round table was recently they, um, they're very entrepreneur. So, but I, two of my sons have their own business. One started a painting business, handyman things, and the other one started detailing cars and like got certified to do ceramic coating and all of that. And, um, and he had gone to college, but decided college wasn't for him. And I'm very supportive of that, you know, like college isn't for everybody, you know, um, and the entrepreneurship, you know, doing your own business kind of is in the family. And so he had made some mistakes and, uh, it all this stuff came out like instead of like owning his choices that I couldn't rescue him. I, you know, I'm like a single mom now and stuff, and I just didn't have the money or whatever to rescue him out of his uh, choices that were really his choices. And it turned into this blame thing. And um, like, well, if you didn't get, if I didn't, if you didn't get divorced, you know, like I wouldn't be here. You should have taught me better money management when we were teenagers. And I'm like, I remember so many conversations where I tried to give you advice and, you know, you didn't want to hear it. Um, and so I, I guess I, that was my, that's my struggle is like where, like, cause I do feel like I choices I made, like, uh, have affected their life and I've, I've, I've owned them. I've apologized them. We're not perfect. You know, we all, I didn't come with a manual on how to 
you know, be a mom and raise them and getting through the teenage years and, uh, and now into these adult years. And like, where is, uh, the, the line where this is your responsibility, you know, like, cause they'll, they'll want to move home. Um, so, uh, three of them now live in Florida that with their dad, they like all share a house, like the oldest owns the house. And then they all, they, ha- it's kind of like a commune down there apparently. And the third one just moved down there because I've downsized recently. And so he's like, well, I'm going to go move and help my brothers with their businesses. And now he's like calling me, like he wants to come back. I'll sleep on your couch. I'll get a job. I, you know, like where I live is small town. So he doesn't need a car. He can you know, walk anywhere and stuff like that. And so he's like trying to convince me and I don't want him to move back here. You know, like I want him to fly. He's going to be 24 and I, and we'll have these huge conversations where it's like, I, you know, I've been working since I was 16 and he won't acknowledge how there's these huge gaps of time where he wasn't actually working. And, (laughs) and so I actually am supporting him during those times and that he won't like admit it. And so I, there's a part of me that feels guilty because when he brings up like, you know, well, if I didn't come from a divorced family and all of that stuff, you know, and, and how the world is so many, I hear so many adult children still live at home because of the way the economy is and the world is right now. It's just too hard to be an adult and be on your own and live on your own. So I guess I just am looking, I'm like this, I uh, like growing up and watching other families with adult children. I feel like they all fly the nest. They all find their way. And I, and I feel like my kids, are struggling and and coming up with excuses and how do I help them? Um, does anybody else in this? <laughs> oh my goodness, girl! I just wish I could come through and just give you a great big hug. I, I'm a hugger, so you know, stick to your guns because how they treat you is how they're going to treat their wife one day or their partner. Uh, you know, so stick to your guns. What you're doing is the very best thing that you could do right now for them. I have seen so many moms enable their children to death, literally. And I come from a family of a lot of drugs and alcohol and stuff. And I've seen two of my uncles die basically. I mean, I, I can't blame it on my grandmothers, you know, they're who were trying to do the absolute best for their children, you know, and we all handle these things differently. So I'm not blaming it on them, but they were so enabled and they weren't allowed to make their mistakes. I mean, we had to make our mistakes. I started making my mistakes of very early girls. Um, you know, so I've, I've told my children, you, you end up in jail. And I tell them this, you end up in jail. You're going to stay the night. I don't care if it's your fault or not. You're going to stay the night. I'm not coming to bail you out. You are going to stay the night. So make the best of it. (laughs) So really you're doing excellent. You're doing a great job. You've done everything that you could. And I mean, I'm, I'm a Bible believer. So at this point I say, you know, I've made all these wonderful mistakes <laughs> and God's grace is got to take up from there. He's, he's going to take up the slack and I've seen it happen over and over. They're going to make their mistakes. They're going to do their thing. And uh, we just got to love them through it. Marie. Okay. This is the absolute best subject for me because I was the enabling mom. And so I'm going to be, you, you're going to be me in you know, 10 more years. If, if I, I get to be the voice my younger self needed. So I did the same thing. Comment, you know, they were, I got a divorce. Their father was never present. I felt guilty for choosing this terrible father for my kids. With that guilt, I tried to put a pillow underneath them every time, you know, so they wouldn't fall. And I can tell you this. So I have three and my oldest daughter is the one that I enabled the most because I didn't know any better. And to this day, she doesn't take care of herself. 
I have set her up an apartment. I have, you know, loaned her money. I have bought her cars. Um, I just, I set her up for failure by not letting her grow. What I learned, Charmin, is the more options you give them to escape their responsibilities, the more they'll take it, right? Why why go the hard route when mom's going to let me look, sit on her couch and she'll probably feed me because she feels really guilty, so she's going to nurture me and take care of me. Now, the difference here, and I'll tell you before this happens for you, is my daughter had three children. So my enabling, and she knew this, was a lot of manipulation because I couldn't not be there because of the kids, the grandkids. And so a lot of my actions were, she's just kind of a package deal, but I got to make sure these grandkids are safe. Um, in fact, I have court this week to take guardianship of my 14-year-old grandson, and her other two uh, live with another grandparent. She doesn't even take care of her kids. So with, his, with her brother and sister, they, A, what was cool was they learned from seeing what she did and said, I'm never going to do that to mom. And they were super responsible for themselves. They never even asked if they could come home. They never, uh, they, they just saw that that wasn't the right thing to do. And my middle daughter just had a house, brand new house built and just moved into it. And it's like, oh, a proud mom moment. I never had a house built. I've always bought other people's houses. Um, and my son, they keep raising his rent. And he keeps saying, I just got to get a better job. I just have to level up so I can afford this. So he's never said, can we come home and live with you? So they got to fall. They got to fall. Let them fall, Charmin. But the biggest thing I learned, and I had a breakthrough, get rid of the guilt. This is, they chose you as a mom. They chose this life, believe it or not. And they're going to learn and be stronger humans for it. I promise you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, love that Marie. By the way, um, and and so what I want to talk about was my husband and I made not sound financial decisions for a long time, and my daughter always point likes to point it out to us. And we actually recently separated my husband and I, as in March. Um, <laughs> so so it's brand new for them, and but it's been bad for a while. So they kind of knew it was going to happen in a way. They actually told us to. She's she's actually said to us to get divorced. So so, but the reality of it is, of course, different. Okay, but it actually, it's like, yeah. By the way, we're gonna get divorced. But you know, for years, you know, she's like, well, you and dad, whatever. And didn't and I'm like, you know what? Learn from us. And they told her flat out. And I'm like, you know what, Nicole? Learn from us. So don't be like us. Like she thought she was like pointing it out to me and like making me feel guilty about it. And I actually just turned it around and I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. I owned up to it. I owned up to all our mistakes, all our financial and stupid mistakes and whatever it is. And I'm like, guess what? Take that and learn from it. And I know people who actually do budgeting and things like that. And I've approached her numerous times um, to do that and stuff like that. And now she's she's going to a senior in college. Um, you know, we've paid for her. She hasn't paid rent for any of her off-campus apartments or anything like that. And, you know, she got a car and we were paying the car insurance too. We're like, you know what? Enough is enough. You got to at least pay something. So now she pays her own car insurance. You know, she was not thrilled about it at first. I'm not going to lie. But but now she's like, and I, you know, we've thanked her for doing that. You know, thank you so much. That really helps and everything like that. But it gives her the sense of pride and things like that. And I hated it too. I grew up, my parents had no money. Side so note, my parents had no money. I had to buy my own car when I was 24. And I, it drove me insane that I was always working, always, but it built me. It built me to who I am. It built me as a person, even though I didn't see it then. So they're not going to see it now. They're not. But eventually they will see it. And the guilt, absolutely, Maureen is a thousand percent right. I'm going on my own healing journey now. The guilt has to go away. And they're going to keep giving us the guilt. They're going to keep pouring into us because that was actually going to be my question later on, which I'll talk about. But like, and you know what? We have to stand our ground because what did our parents do to us? They did the same thing to us a lot of times. They stood our ground and it's like, here, go. OB, I'm 53. So it was like, yeah, go do something. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in the seventies and eighties. My mom was working full time. It was like, you have to figure it out. And it was annoying, but I did. And so they have to figure it out and they will. And you know what? You'll be there for them and you'll be there to support them. Like we're here to support her no matter what, but yeah, you have to let them fly because otherwise they're never going to do it. They're always going to have an out. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, guys. Anyone else? Real Dr. quick, real quick, Charmin, I want to say this. I changed my verbiage from how can I help you to how are you going to fix that? <gasps> and that that made a really big difference. Oh. Write it down, Sean, and write it down, girl. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, That's so good. good. Can you say it again, Maureen? I changed it from um, how can I help you to how are you going to fix this? Beautiful. That's Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good question. I love it. Thank you, Sharman. I appreciate it. Um, Tana, you're next. Thanks for that, Sharman. Really, really interesting. And yes, it's a challenge that we all face. Um, but I, I was wondering, I've learned so much from the period when I was in hospital. I've, I've done masses of, of this self-reflection to try and understand why it is that so many people end up in and um, having mental health problems and so on and recognize that it really does start within the first few, few years of life. Uh, not it, but the potential is built in, not because we're all beating our kids or anything like that, literally even the, in the happiest of families, the potential's there. But in doing that study on me and looking and exploring and all the work that I've done with teenagers, um, I really have begun to understand why I react to, have reacted to my own children and to other people's children as pupils because of what, what I've experienced in my life. And I came from a really, really happy family, but it's very interesting to know, to see my insecurities or my issues coming out in my children when I've worked so hard to make sure that they felt incredibly secure and, and paid attention to and all those kinds of things. And I'm just to give you a very quick example, when I was, working as a secondary school teacher, I used to create lots of really, really unusual, um, very special events and opportunities for any child in the school to come out of the shadows and know who they were and to be seen by other people. Because there's so many kids that go around and they're just not noticed. Nobody knows they even exist. And it took me years to recognize that the reason that I was doing this so relentlessly that took you know, hours and hours and hours of my time on top of teaching was to actually give them what I never felt that I had, but I'd never recognized it as that. I didn't realize that I was doing everything as an adult to make sure that teenagers had all the things that I didn't have. And that purely came about the fact that my mom died when I was seven and, um, in those days, there was no counselling. There was no opportunity to talk these things through. It was just a case of shut up the feelings and it, it, you knew it was going to happen. It's happened. It's over. And that I would keep showing people through my essays how much pain I was in, how lonely I was as a teenager, how abandoned I felt as a teenager because she'd left me by dying. And nobody stopped and they said, A star, A star for all your essays, but nobody stopped and said, how are you doing? You know, how are you actually feeling? Are you okay? And I'm just wondering, what do you see in your children's behaviors or what have you seen or what has made you connect in a difficult way with your children, which on a reflection you realize comes from you yourself? It's a recognition of you and you're actually fighting yourself. Is there anything about your relationship with your children that's made you sit up and be more aware? Um, okay, so uh, Karen, it actually was going to be my question, but it's interesting oh, you see sorry. that. <laughs> it's fine. Well, it's part. My answer is actually it was partly my question, but it's interesting you say that um, because I too am on this journey now of healing and learning stuff that I've done in adulthood and even to my children and just my own life, even in my marriage, um, was like traumas that I faced that I've had, you know, from childhood and things like that. So it's very, you know, that's an interesting journey that I'm on. And it, this just happened to me recently where my daughter laid into me. She absolutely, this was a week and a half ago, she absolutely laid into me, basically telling me, you know, things that I did or didn't do and the reason why, you know, she has panic attacks and anxiety. I mean, and she just went off on me, like literally went off on me. And I didn't say anything to her, but that was the mirror. That was the mirror of like, 
you know, when I dropped her off at college and, you know, you know, I didn't, I didn't say I missed her. Like my husband was like, I miss you so much and I'm going to miss you. Blah, blah blah. And I didn't say that to her. And I, because I knew, and, but I, what I also didn't say to her was I knew by her going away to college and picking university of Delaware was going to make her fly and flourish. And that it was absolutely hundred percent the right thing to do. But I never said that. I never actually verbalized that to her by not verbalizing it to her. It apparently messed, messed her up in a way. And that was my mirror. Like all the stuff that she was saying to me was like, holy crap. And like just stuff that I, I recognized that I had done and, and recognizing my things that she's like, and she even pointed out to me, she's like, you know, you say your mom did this, you know, with your brother and you do the same with mine. And I was like, ah. And, and, and actually the next day I actually called, told her how brave she was to tell me all that stuff. Like I actually took yeah. it not as a bad thing. I was like, oh my God. Like I, but it was absolutely the mirror moment of like, holy shit. Like, yeah. wow. You know, and, but you have to also own up to that. And then how do you then move on from that? And it's looking at your reaction. I mean, your first reaction can be hurt or anger or, you know, how could you've had this argument with me about it? But the actual, it is about taking ownership, isn't it? Of that mirror that I mean, our kids are our mirrors all mm -hmm. the way through from the very tiniest age. They're mirroring what might be our weakness or what might be our pain point. And sometimes, like with me, you're trying so hard to make sure they don't come out with the same pains that actually just exa exacerbate the problem. Um, so really, really interesting. Uh, and well done for you actually saying to her, yes owning up to it because that probably will have meant more to her than anything at all and and i'll be honest the, re the whole entire reason i was able to even have that reaction was all the personal development work and all the healing that i'm doing based off of all the you know all the work that i've been doing the last year and a half i would have never had that reaction otherwise so there's something to be said you know you know what i mean owning up to it is not it's not easy owning up to your mistakes as a parent as a human being but it's i'm learning how heard of it <laughs> but not just yourself but for your kids <laughs> yeah absolutely brilliant thank you karen really appreciate that anyone else who else recognizes anything about themselves or yeah donita oh my goodness i told our oldest on a regular basis that she was my guinea pig because my mother was an eternal teenager. She was a teenager when she had me and she just, she stayed a teenager for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the drugs and the alcohol and, and uh, so I really didn't experience a mom at all. And it, so I'm like, I have no idea what I am doing with you <laughs> on a regular basis. And she mirrored my mother a lot and it scared me. So I was a tough mom with her, really, really tough. And uh, I remember she was turning 18 and there was a fella taking a, a fancy to her and I knew that it wasn't a good match, just not a good match. I, it would have been, it would have turned into an abusive situation, I think. Um, so I took her off for an internship in the city I, and I, uh, three hours away and I signed her up. I told my husband, she has to go. She has to. And I have done everything that I can at this point. I I've done the best I can and she's got to go. So I took her and being homeschooled all of her life, she did this internship where she was teaching character in the public schools in Oklahoma City. And I took her and I dropped her off and I did everything I could to not be emotional girls. I mean, I wanted to ball, oh my baby, you know, what? but I didn't. And I just, okay, well, you're here, you know, uh, I, whatever. And, you know, be careful because these people probably don't understand hick life and where you've come from. And, and I just kind of said goodbye and walked away and left and cried all the way home. And, um, that was the best thing I ever did for her. And her and I will both say now that it was very difficult for both of us, but being able to take her and let her go and do that 
And then each one of mine, when they're about 15, they hit a crisis. I've watched that with every single one of mine and they will tell you. And with the youngest, she just turned 15 this last year and everybody kept telling her all the other children, well, adults now kept telling her it's your age. It's your age because she's just, she's bottled up, you know, right now. And uh, she finally broke down, finally broke down. And, and one of them was going to go up and talk to her. And I'm like, no, I'll handle this one. So I go upstairs to talk to her. And I, and I just sit there and just start asking her questions, you know, and, and it, it's all the crisis things that you're going through whenever you're 15. But every single one of them have done this whenever they were 15. And they always feel better afterwards. You know, mm -hmm. they get it all out of their system. They, they give all the feelings and everything. And we're cowboys out here. So, you know, feelings are hard for us. Um, but... <sighs> I almost committed suicide when I was 15. Mm. I hit a crisis in my life when I was 15 and I came that close to killing myself. And I wonder, you know, uh, there's so much research being done now that uh, kind of proves that that can be handed down. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. There's so, so much evidence, um, yes. and and that's not a. This is not a pointing fingers guilt thing. This is you know like well, it's your fault, but it it passes trauma passes on a cellular level, uh, and can really play its role even though it seems completely connect disconnected from your situation when you were fifteen. And uh, so with the clients that I have, I see that happening all the time. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Who else is recognized? Maureen. I have a couple of things. That was actually going to be my question um, was, you know, if you recognize when your kids say something about your parenting and you don't, you know, you're not aware you did that. Um, I've learned that it's their perception of my parenting. Maybe they don't, maybe I don't remember that happening, but if they bring it up, then it was impactful to them. And I have to respect that that's their perception. The other thing is, I was a codependent. I came from a household where um, I love Karen. What you were saying, we were the unsupervised generation. You know, we did not talk about our feelings. It was like just shut up and put up, suck it up, Buttercup. Just you know, just do the chores and be quiet and do your homework. Um, so I was very codependent, and my mother was very. Um, there was no emotion there. She was Irish Catholic, and you know, she she was very angry a lot of the time. So I became a very people pleasing codependent. And so what happened was my oldest through my guilt, Charmin, of making sure I took care of everything and enabling her, I didn't realize I was blinded to the fact because I wanted to be unconditionally loving because I felt I always had conditional love. I realized just in the last couple of years that my daughter has, I would say narcissistic personality disorder that's my oldest and I would force my other children to have a relationship I would say you need to call your sister you guys need to get along I don't have a good relationship with my siblings please I just want you three when I'm gone I need you to get along well I've become estranged from my oldest daughter because it's not healthy for me to have her in my life and then I finally said to my other two oh my gosh I'm so sorry for trying to force that on you because you experience this, my, my middle daughter would say, I, I was scared to say no to her since I was, you know, little. She goes, Mom, she's been like this my whole life. I didn't see it because my guilt got in the way. And I, one of the, the takeaways is allow siblings, especially Charmin with six, five, five, five. Allow the siblings to have their own relationship. Like, let them figure it out and that was my mistake was like you guys all need to get along and i was blinded to her actual behavior and then i finally had to step back and say i can't i just can't do this i i love you but i'm gonna love you over there because it's not healthy when you're right here and i finally in my middle daughter i ended up having anxiety and panic attacks because she sort of saw mom being this codependent and forcing her to put up with this narcissistic 
person in her life. So I just think perception and allowing siblings to have their own relationships, um, that's up to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tana. I appreciate that. I'm going to hand the mic over to um, Brenda. Thank you, Sabrina. You know, I hearing all of the stories today, I think we are all a product of our environment. And then the things that we learn as children, we either mimic or it wasn't healthy and we absolutely change it. And so for myself, I had two completely different parents, both immigrants to Canada, but my father was from London and my mother was Filipino. Two completely different cultures, two right. completely different religions. And I learned a lot of things, but I was also very bullied because I stood out. We lived in a neighborhood that was, I'm going to say, very vanilla. <laughs> and I had an interracial family in the 70s. We stood out. So I was very cognizant and aware of bullying when our kids were growing up. And so I was wanting to teach our children independence to help them find their way. So by the time they are in their adulting years, that they have that confidence and that voice that they can stand up. And I find that, yeah, it, it was really difficult at certain times in my parenting journey. I'm also a bonus mom to our 26 year old son. I never use the word stepmom. I'm sorry. Disney ruined that for all stepmoms. They're wicked. They're evil. <laughs> I just don't use that word. <laughs> and he's six foot seven and I'm four eleven. Everybody knows I could not create anything, <laughs> a human that large. Uh, I also find that when you're in a family of blended marriages where many of us have come from that, there's so many different parenting styles and sometimes they don't match right? And how do you help guide your children into adulthood when you've got three or possibly four different influences all sharing different messages from their childhood yeah. or their experiences? Totally. So I find for myself, I guess my question is, is that I'm really enjoying as, you know, Brayden is now out of the house and he's got his own place and he's working full time. And now I've got the 20 year old daughter coming up and I kind of have to laugh to myself. You guys, sometimes there's some moments where gas is high. She's filling up the gas in her Jeep. She's like, Holy cow. I'm like, yes, it's called adulting. <laughs> you need to start budgeting for these things. Gas is expensive or, you know, can you go to the store and pick up something? She's going to be, holy smokes, is butter ever expensive? Yes, 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 welcome to the real world. And just reminding them that giving you want to give your kids the opportunity to fly, to flourish. And I really worked hard when they were children to teach them independence. It literally started with making lunches in kindergarten. We would make lunch every Sunday, make it and all the sandwiches, put them in the freezer, all the, here's your fruit, here's your snacks, here's your, on Monday morning, you go and you take what sandwich you want and you take what fruit you want, you take what vegetables you want, you take what snack you want. I don't know what you want to eat. It's your morning, it's your lunch. You, you made it on Sunday and now you get to pick it on Monday. And just small little things to teach that independence. Now I find that my adult children or my daughter per se, still falls back on the, hey, mom, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? I'm like, what do you think about this? Like, like I can give you my opinion, but how, what do you think about that? And she always wants to come and ask me, e even for the simplest things, an outfit, or what do you think about this? Should I bring this? What? Tell you, I'm not wearing it. <laughs> check the weather, figure out what it is that you would like to like, make your make small decisions that you're going to feel comfortable with because those small decisions become big decisions. So it's funny that sometimes there's that fallback where they want 
to ask mom for the support, the question, or the advice. And then other times they completely blow you away because they have, they're so strong in their conviction of how they would deal with something. And so my question to you, ladies, is how do you help guide your children when there's some really big, solid decisions that they need to make? And are you just stepping right back and just letting them make that decision? Or are you kind of helping to guide? I know right now it took a long time for my daughter to decide what she wanted to do when she grew up. Grew up. I'm 53. I don't know what I want to do. I said, at 19, you don't need to have all of your courses decided. Take courses. Find out what you like. Make your decision. It might change. That's okay. I always thought I was going to be a physical educator with summers off and a whistle around my neck. No, I'm an event producer. I work every weekend. What is No, it's what you start out thinking you're going to love could completely change. So I would love to hear what you feel. How do you help guide them in those big, big things like, what do I want to be? How do you help nurture their independence and guide them to make their own decisions while still being that fantastic support group? Would anyone like to share their their thoughts on that? I do. Tana, I would love to hear yeah. this one. Hi. I mean, we started it really young with our children, um, and I think that's really helped them to be able to make important decisions later on. Uh, really young. I mean, when, when my son was five, a long way ago, there was this the the um, civil war in Bosnia, and he expressed a lot of concern about what was happening to the children in Bosnia because he could hear it on the news the whole time, and it really, you know, children are so much more empathetic than we think they are, and he felt what was going on. So we said to him, "What do you need to know?" And he said, "I want to know what we're doing to help them." And we, and I didn't have the answers straight away, and I said, "Well, why don't we write to somebody and find out?" what's going on and what they're doing. And I could see he was getting really upset about it, but he needed answers. And I didn't feel that I was the right person to give him the answers. So in the end, we actually encouraged him. I just said to him, why don't you write to the prime minister and ask him? And the next thing I know, this child who hated writing spent hours to write a long paragraph that said, I want to know what's going on. What are, what are we doing to help the children? And he actually got letter back from the prime minister and the minister of defense and wow. the house of violence. He got three or four explaining what they were doing so then he said we said you know well that's what they're doing what can we do and I said what about trying to raise some money for them so as a five-year-old he was very sporty he did a triathlon a little mini triathlon that we set up with him and he raised 104 pounds and he sent it to war child then when he was nine he was talking about children who didn't have the same advantages as him so we said well you know you, why don't you use your sport to do something about it so he cycled a marathon distance as part of a charity fundraiser and raised a lot of money by asking people himself. And, and it was about giving them opportunities and taking the, validating their interests and then helping them to find a way of doing something with it. And my daughter came when she was, I think, 17 and really wanted to do, do a school trip that was after the end of her final year when she was 18. And we just said, we don't, we really don't have the money. I absolutely want you to have this opportunity because we knew it would bring her out of her shell. And it was to go to Tanzania for a number of weeks with just seven other people from school. And we said, but we can't do it. But if you could pay a half of it and raise the money for the half of it, then absolutely we'll put your name down. And, and that was it. So she set about walking people's dogs and cleaning people's flats and watering people's gardens when they were away and doing everything and I'll never forget the day as a 17 and a half year old she came to me with a wad of notes and said here's a thousand pounds that she'd earned to get herself to be able to go and do that experience so I think it's about for me it's about really eyeballing your kids and hearing what it is they're struggling is whether there is an 18 year old trying to decide on their career or a 13 year old trying to cope with whether they should get, whether they can get into a football team or not and really talk to them sort of in an adult way about how they could go about coming finding a solution and finding an answer and that's really stood both our kids really well in them being able to make decisions they know we're always there to discuss it but ultimately we throw the ball back in their court and say you know these are all your options 
you've come up with them all, but you're the only one who can actually decide which one's right for you. So that's my penny's worth on that. Thank you. I 100% I agree. And I think that they they watch a lot more than we realize. And they, sometimes when they're almost mirror imaging, things that we've shared with them, and then all of a sudden they're actually actioning what we've done or how we've acted, it's, we know we've had that really positive influence in helping them. Maureen, you had your hand up. Thank you. I love, I love that, Tanya. That is, that's amazing. What I learned is that my verbiage had to change with my adult children versus when they were younger. And the key thing was figuring out each of my children's love language. So they were all, they're all different. So being able to figure out my son is a words of affirmation. And so I'm going to be more impactful when I give him those, you're doing great, you're amazing, you can you can do this. I, I have confidence you can make this decision. That the verbiage had to change instead of like you were saying, well, you should do this. I would say, well, if it were me, and then it felt less like I was lecturing a little boy and it felt more like he's just talking to a friend and getting advice. And it's funny that that shift just happened like I was talking about earlier. So figuring out their love language, there's timing. My middle daughter, um, she's very acts of service. So she's not very touchy feely. She's not words of affirmation. She's acts of service. And so doing things for her, helping her financially, um, you know, if she's in a, a moment and, and you know, she'll, she'll pay mom back or just showing up for her. So she gets this brand new house, wants everybody there for Thanksgiving. She lives in Austin, I'm in Phoenix, and we gotta pack up everyone, get a dog sitter for three dogs, but we're doing it. And she's like, I don't know if you can. And I said, absolutely, we will. So I think really it's the verbiage and it's just showing up for them in whatever way their love language is and giving them the power. I think that's the thing that maybe we didn't get, all of us, um, is I didn't feel empowered as a child. I didn't feel I got choices. I didn't, I didn't feel like, like I had a say in anything. Then that's what creates codependence is, <coughs> excuse me, this lack of choices. And so I think when we're transitioning them from teenagers and even as young kids, um, we can start it, but from transitioning them from teenager to adult is I always tell my son, well, make a list of the pros and cons and and I always say, what would your future self thank you for? That's a good way to present them with a decision. What would your future self say about this decision? So it's how we talk to them. Thanks. Thank you. I love that. I love that. Karen? I love the future self thing. I'm, I, that's like, I do that now with even myself. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I just love that so much. Um, but one of the things also is, um, you know, I think you're right, Maureen, with empowering them. Like my daughter, sometimes they just want us to, they they know they want to make the decision, but they need us to just let them know it's okay to make that decision. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, my daughter's in Delaware and she has a boyfriend and, you know, I knew she wasn't coming home. Like I knew the second she went to college that she wasn't coming back to Staten Island. I knew that. Um, and she was home. I think it was, you know, she was home for, for a little bit of winter break a couple of years ago um, after she met the boyfriend. And, you know, we were talking about living in Delaware and whatever else. And I'm like, I turned around and I flat out said to her, like, she was trying to broach the subject ever so lightly. I'm like, Nicole, I know you're not moving back to Staten Island. I'm fully aware that you're not moving back to Staten Island. And by the way, I love the fact that you don't want to. And I love the fact that you want to build a life in Delaware and go build a life in Delaware. Amazing. Love it. Love it for you. Um and that kind of a thing. And so I think she just needed my permission um, in a way, I guess I'm th that may be a word, but like, I was like, yeah, I know. Like, and, and you know what? And, you know, and now they're moving, you know, they're moving together the next year and everything like that. And, you know, it was just that moment of, okay, I got it out <laughs> and now it's good. And now we can, you know, and then it was all good. So I think that's a way of fostering dependence too, is just letting them know, letting them in on the secret in a way, because, you know, you know what's going on, but maybe sometimes they don't know that. 
Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you sharing that because of fantastic learning from everyone. Sabrina. Yes, thank you so much, Brenda. Appreciate that question. Miss Karen, you are up next. So like my question has changed being <laughs> this conversation that we're having and stuff like that. So I'm actually none of, I know some of us have had, you know, kids that are married and some of you grandparents and stuff like that. So I'm actually switching my question to relationships. So background, my husband, I, um, it's been, it was bad for quite a number of years, our marriage. Um, and like I said earlier, we've, we decided to divorce and, and, it's, and we're fine. It's actually the right thing to do when we're very amicable about it. However, that being said, both of my kids are in relationships. So my daughter's going to be 21, her and her boyfriend are two years together. Like I said, they're going to move in together after they graduate and probably get married and things like that. My son is 16 and he's been in a relationship for like a year. Um, and I see learning now that I'm, I learned recently with my healing that I'm, was a person who liked to be in control and codependent. And I had no idea that I was that. Um, and so now I see things, and because my husband and I are divorcing, I see things now from a hugely different lens. So all the work that I'm doing on me and all the things, I now see things that I perhaps didn't see before. So I, I'm trying to rein back from the controlling and things like that and whatever else, but like, and I know, my relationship wasn't great, but I'm trying to explain to my kids, like have a life outside of your relationship and trying to, you know, talk to them. And I don't want to say give pointers, like let them be independent, but I also don't want them to make the same mistakes that we did in a way. Like, so how do you like pull back a little bit when you're controlling and codependent? And now that you see things through a different lens and you see things going on, how do you just be like, okay, give yourself the grace like, what do you do for yourself? It's not even so much for your kids because I'm learning that, but like, what do you do for yourself to be like, okay, I know I need not to do this. I know I need not to say something. What are, what are some things that you do for yourself in order of which not to, you know, it's not good to say something, but sometimes you just react and want to do something. I'm going to reverse it a little. <laughs> Go ahead, Sabrina. Um, so one of the things I do, not only with my son, but just in general in life is I allow, there's also codependent by the way. Um, well, I don't want to say I still am, but getting over that. So, uh, one of the things that I always felt as a codependent is I needed to react quickly. So question asked, immediate answer, something needs to get done, do it immediately. And so I'm going a thousand miles an hour in every direction other than my direction <laughs> of what I need. So one of the things that I've been doing for years now is I understand that when somebody asks something of me or asks me a question, I have the choice to like check in with myself and and kind of ask, like, is that something that I actually want to do? Is that something that I actually know the answer to? Um, how do I actually want to answer that? And just giving myself, and the other person doesn't even necessarily ignore, like recognize that you're doing it. It's not like, give me 30 seconds. It's just taking a few moments to be like, what do I actually want to say or do or not to do? And just those few extra seconds really allows me to be able to answer more authentically towards myself. So, I mean, it's, it works wonders for myself. And I think it actually has really allowed me to love myself. Like I inside appreciate that I outside am, am doing that for myself. I love that. I, I know to do that. Like I have that tool, but it's surrendering is <laughs> because I was a person that always liked to be in control. So surrendering for me has been. And, and just to add to that, sometimes it does take me a little while. Like my fiance sometimes will ask me to do something or ask me a question and I'll take a little too long and he'll be like, hello. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> like, I'm trying to think of the answer. Like, you know, give me right. a second. So, um, and he gets it, like he, he understands my journey and everything that I'm doing. So, you know, it doesn't become like a whole thing, but, um, you know, just recognizing that, you know, and sometimes saying mm -hmm. what you think they don't want you to say takes a little longer. 
So like when you know they want you to say yes, but you actually authentically want to say no, sometimes right. that takes a little extra second to get that no out of your mouth. <laughs> That's true. Donita. I think sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to say both. Um, there's been times with my oldest now that I'm, I'm a grandma too, and she is a bonus mom. She, or dad, I didn't have a good relationship with my stepmother. I called her step monster most of the time. If you watch the Cindy, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and we didn't watch Disney movies because of that. Uh, um, but when Catherine will ask me about something that either I know I can't really relate to in the same way that, that, that she's dealing with it, or that I know that their situation is different because he's 20 years older than her. My husband's 15 years older than me. That extra five years may not seem like a lot, but he already had three children and she was older when she got married. I was younger when, so there's a lot of things that are different. And uh, sometimes she'll press me for an answer on something she knows how I feel about, you know, but she's wanting me to tell her what to do basically. And, uh, and I have to tell her, well, my first reaction, my first thought is this, but because your situation is different and because you are a different person, I would caution you this way, you know, and so think about it that way. And that way it gives you permission. It gives me permission to say, this is how I really feel about this. But I, I'm giving you permission to make a different choice and a different decision to, to do something different without judgment. Because I made different decisions than my parents and my grandparents before me. And I don't judge them for the decisions that they made. I've just chosen to do something different. And you're going to do the same thing. And that's okay. Live a different life. Oh my God, I love that so much. <laughs> I absolutely, oh my God, I'm totally doing that. I love, I literally, that's like brilliant. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Anyone else? Go ahead, Maureen. I was waiting for you, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, having my grandson now, raising my grandson, it really shows you all the mistakes you made with your kids. You get kind of a do-over. And so I'm getting a little do-over now. And what I'm realizing with my grandson is like, like um, Sabrina, I'm practicing the pause a lot before I say anything to him. And he's very sensitive. Like he's emotionally intelligent and he hasn't been taught life skills, but he's so, he's very intuitive and perceptive of people. And he's very, he's very um, sensitive where my son was just like, you know, tough as nails. So what I'm learning with my grandson is I think about what he's been through with the, the trauma that he's already had in his life. And so I put myself in my children's and grandchildren's shoes more often of how is this going to be ex received? Will they meet me at the place I'm delivering it? You know, if they're not at that place, if they're overly emotional, don't go in their guns of blazing. This is what you need to do. This is how it needs to be done. But practicing the pause and using that thought process of how will this impact him later? And I'm not going to lie. I also think, are they going to throw this back on me later? So I better do this right. So, you know, there's that too. But yeah, practicing the pause, definitely, Sabrina. And who cares how long you take if you get it right? And and one more thing that I did that I'm doing better with my grandson than I did with my grand than I did with my kids is I apologize when I mess up and I just say, oh, you know what? Oh, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Or I'm sorry. I was a little short with you. So you, you never get it done and you never get it right. But be 
be that teacher, that leader for your children that says, we all screw up, even I screw up, and I apologize and own it and take accountability when I do screw up. Uh, screw up. So I think that's the difference now with raising my, my grandson that I didn't do with my kids because I was too busy um, and stressed out to apologize and too emotional, to be honest with you. Now I'm clear-headed, and the advantages of my grandson having a life coach as a grandma is, he doesn't know it yet. <laughs> thank you. No, that's, you know, it's, it, thank you. I do, I do tend to sometimes apologize, but the pause I don't do enough of for sure. And I like the whole future self. I like doing, you know, and it coming back to me. Those are, those are really great. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's really very helpful. Thank you. Oh, Brenda. Do you ever have an aha moment that somebody says something to you about your personality that you don't realize and you're like, maybe that's why my children are that. So, <laughs> so I was asked by the vice principal of my high school who I bumped into to help with the school's 50th anniversary. And I was sharing this with another classmate that, oh, you know, this vice principal that we had has asked me to help with this reunion and I'm so busy but I'm going to help. And he looks at me and he goes, well, that's because you're a people pleaser. What? I'm, I'm not a people pleaser. He goes, yes, you are. You've always been a people pleaser. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm an event planner. <laughs> this is what event planners do. We take care of everybody. <laughs> we make sure the VIPs are on time. We make sure this is done. We make, I'm not a people pleaser. This is what I do. And then I, it was just not that, people pleasing he said it in a mean way but i took it as oh what do you mean i have a flaw <laughs> so because i'd never thought of myself as a people pleaser i have to do that for my role in my career but as a person and then i started seeing this in my daughter i'm like oh she's mirroring me she's a people pleaser well, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> so, and so once I had it brought to my attention, I could redirect that course in how I became a better parent to my daughter because it was the biggest aha moment. And I will thank him forever that he put something so in my face that I, it, it literally rocked me. So Back when I was saying how I had a hard time dealing with bullying as a child, I'm just going to share a real quick story. My daughter at 16 heard about an adult who was 75, said something very rude and awful at a football game about her grandfather. She was working the sideline. We serve the professional football players Gatorade. She said, mom, I'll be right back. I'm like, what's going on? She goes, you, you know that guy up there on the stands? I'm like, yes. She goes, he's not gonna enjoy the rest, second half of the game. <laughs> I was like, okay, what? We had heard, we were on a trip across Canada. We had heard that this gentleman who is 75 years old said something and upset my husband. When we came back to Winnipeg, we were serving the Gatorade to the players. She leaves at halftime, goes up the stands, comes down, comes right down to the first row because this guy sat right behind us. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Makes her way, crouches down, and she's like, sir, I'm Mr. So-and-so's granddaughter. And I heard what you said about my grandfather last game. I'm 16 years old and I know that that's not right. And he's like, oh, oh, it's fine. And he's sitting with his adult children who are mortified. I think they're going to cry in their beer. They're absolutely mortified that my 16 year old is taking their father to task. And she's like, that's not right. That's not right. What you said is not right. And nobody talks about my family that way. And I'm standing at field level with the security guard. And he's like, is that your daughter talking to that fan who was saying mean things to your husband last game? I'm like, and I'm standing back there. I'm like, mm-hmm, buckle in because he don't know what's coming. 
Tessa because don't mess with Tessa. Like she was so fired up and then she got emotional and all the fans around, they couldn't hear what was going on, but they could see that she was addressing this. And then she just turned on her heel and walked up the stands and came back down to the field level. And I had people texting me on Facebook and emailing like, is, is everything okay? Is everything okay? I'm like, oh, everything's fine. <laughs> Somebody Sometimes lessons need to be taught to adults. And that was the aha moment for me that I have empowered my child to find her voice and stand up for herself and for our family if someone does you wrong. I never had that voice as a child, but I sure helped my daughter find hers. And that was because I was told I was a people pleaser. <laughs> so thank you for the question, because I think that we don't even realize sometimes how the lessons that we learn and how we can direct and share. And at the end of the day, we just want to raise independent, strong, kind, empathetic humans. Yeah. And if we do that, we're golden. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. That was a phenomenal story. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for taking the mic. We are going to hand it to Donita. Well, we've talked a lot today about, you know, we raised our children this way. We did this with them when they were younger. And so many times we feel like all the mistakes have been made, all the advice has been given. Um, what if and I'm sure there's some people in the comments that are watching this or that are going to watch this later. What if my children are already older? I can't go back when they were younger and teach them these things that maybe I should have taught, you know, or take back the things that I did whenever they were younger. What do I do now that they're older and they're making these mistakes and I'm watching this stuff and they won't listen to me or whatever the thing is. What can they do now? Because I totally believe it's never too late. It, it's never too late to, to make an impression and to love on your children and to give them tough love, even if that's what's needed. So I would like to hear what you ladies have to say about what, what about now? What do we do now? That's actually a great question because we're all children of a, of adults. <laughs> so I don't necessarily have an answer right now, but I'm trying to think. I'm I'm trying to think the opposite. Like, what do I wish my parents would do differently? I don't know. It's a good question. Marie. I've noticed like what I was saying earlier about just taking accountability is that's, that's been a, the game changer. And also you guys being vulnerable with your kids and saying, you know what, at this stage, when this was happening, this is what I was going through. And, you know, I wasn't the best mom at that moment. And that's been for my kids, my adult kids, they have so much compassion and empathy that they can let go of those past things. And, and when you see them making those choices, you just say, you know, I don't want you to do what I did at this point when this happened. And when I wasn't, I wasn't being the best mom I could be, but I wasn't in the best state of mind or very financial situation. So I think being vulnerable with our children really, really helps them to have more compassion and an understanding with their mom. And, and I, I've always said this to my kids, <coughs> sorry. I've always said to my kids on every birthday, I've never been the mom of a nine-year-old or I've never been the mom of a 32-year-old, you know? So they know this is new for me. Every year that they, they change, I have to say, this is all brand new for me too. So we're doing this together. And I think just having, helping your kids understand you know, there's no dress rehearsal for parenting. We're just doing the 
best we can at the moment. And if we fail in some areas, we apologize. If we succeed, then we pat ourselves on the back. Let's see, Tana, I think you had your hand up earlier. I was actually going to say a very similar thing is, is I think it's acknowledging. I mean, I've had honest conversations with my adult children about the things that I realize now that I got wrong um, and that, and, and also why I think I got them wrong. I used to react with my son when he was really quite young. He was, I've always maintained that I'm not an angry person. I don't do anger has been my kind of mantra. Well, I've discovered the reason I don't do anger is because I buried it. And actually I've been very angry about you know my mom's death all my life but i just i'm a people pleaser whoa um i i felt so aggrieved when i discovered that as if it was a real put down that it's made me realize the way i am so i and my son he used to make me really angry when he was four or five i mean explosive and i kept saying nobody else does this to me but everybody adores him i adore him he's the most captivating child what is it about him and it's taken me a lifetime to realize that he all he needed to do was tilt his chin in a particular way of somebody who was in my life when I was a child, who was quite overbearing and used to put me down and made me feel afraid, I suppose, on the back foot. And as an adult, I was able to react when I couldn't as a child. So, but I've always felt really guilty because I did, I never hit my children at all, but I did push him quite hard a couple of times because I was so angry with him. And, you know, we've talked about that as adults, about I've wanted to apologize that that's what happened and this was why, and for him to recognize his behaviors in other people and what he triggers in other people and why he reacts to particular colleagues in the way that he does based on things that he experienced as a child. Uh, and I think helping our older children to understand that we responding to other people whether it's us as their parents or whether it's colleagues or relations, re relatives, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, based on what we're respond responding to, we're either mimicking or fighting against from our childhood. And once I started having those conversations, it's really opened up so much of me being able to apologize, me being able to recognize and to help them to understand the reasons why I reacted the way that I did so that they start to recognize that in themselves. And I think it's just about whatever age our children are, whether they're 50, it's about having that conversation open and just always being authentic. It's like you were saying, Maureen, it's just about being really authentic to yourself and being vulnerable to your weaknesses and holding your hand up and say, yep, I didn't get that right. So. I love that communication, so important. Karen? It's funny. I was there's a few things. Number one, I think the, the fact that we even create the space for them to have to say something to us is is important. Um, you know, you know, my daughter laid into me, like I said earlier, she, you know, she laid into me, but like I had created the space for her to do it. So that's important too. And to your point, Tana, my my son does a lot of things. Like talking about mirror earlier, my son does a lot of things. He mirrors a lot of behaviors that my husband has. Um, some of them not great. <laughs> <laughs> so I find myself now, that's why I also asked the question, because I find myself now that we're separating, I'm like, oh, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things one of a trauma coach just taught me was meet them with compassion. So that's the other thing is, you know, meeting them with compassion, because where are they coming from? What are they feeling? And, and, and things like that. And, and, um, you know, my daughter has a very strained relationship with my mother. You know, and so I think part of the thing too is breaking that cycle, for lack of a better way to put it. That's something I learned from Tracy Litt is breaking that cycle, you know. And so one of the things I learned was like, I told my daughter, like, you don't have to have a relationship. I'm like, but, you know, sometimes my mother's 81. Okay. And so she just, there's certain things that are just embedded in her. And I'm like, so, you know, I'm like, so if you don't want to have a relationship, don't. Like, and I didn't mean that in a bad way, but I was like, and I, and I, and I'm like, you know what, I'll talk to her and I have talked to my mother. And that, that's the other thing as a child going to your parent and saying to them, you know, from the grandchild, you know what I mean? And saying, cause even, you know, certain things that are not great. And my daughter has had conversations with my mother about certain things. And I have too, about things that, you know, she does that are not, 
That's so great. And to my mother's credit, she's tried to change them to the best of her abilities. You know what I mean? And so I think that's part of it too, is, is addressing, knowing that, okay, we, you were vulnerable, you made the mistake, everything like that. But also we were talking about the relationships with the siblings early. It's the same thing with, you know, with their grandparents and things like that. It's a matter of, you don't have to do something if it makes you feel uncomfortable to the point of, it's that bad for you. It's, it's like detrimental to you. It's like, you know what, then then you have to be the parent to be like, you know what, no, that's okay. And see it from their point of view and not the shoulds. You should, because, you know, we grew up in the era of you, well, you should do this and you should do that and should, 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 should. And it's not should. It's, you know what, give them the, the ability to realize, you know, and, and understand where they're coming from. And I think that's really important too. And it never stops. Listen, I'm 53, like I said, and I totally need my mother for certain things. And you know what? I've also learned one last thing I'll say is the Ho'oponopono prayer. Um, I don't know if anybody knows that, but I learned that. Again, I work very closely with Tracy Litt. And that was one of the things I learned because it's not about, it's not, forgiveness is not about, you know, it's not about them. It's about yourself too. And I've learned to do the Ho'opono prayer, prayer with certain things that my mom and certain things that my mom did. And listen, according to my daughter, I repeat the same thing about, you know, certain things treating my son differently than her and things like that. And I apologize for it. I'm like, I didn't mean to do it. But then I did the Ho'oponopono to the guilt. I'm like, I can't feel guilty about it. You know what I mean? Like I did it. it, it I apologize for it. And, uh, you know, the Ho'oponopono prayer works in, in terms of, of just forgiveness in terms of understanding this is what you've done how can we move forward what can we do to make it better and they need to do that for themselves too she may hold it against me for the rest of my life i don't know she may not but you know i can give her the tools to be like okay maybe this is a good route for you to go you know you need to release it for yourself not for me i i think i, I totally agree with that the biggest problem with motherhood is uh well, there's two guilt <laughs> and us not forgiving ourselves. I, my mother could never forgive herself. Uh, and you know, it, it was a problem with our relationship until the day she passed away. And don't do that. Forgive yourself. That is so, so important. Sabrina. Um, I think it's important to also recognize, you know, like I said, I, my oldest is 18, so I'm not like, thoroughly um, experienced in as much as some of you are, but I'm thinking of myself with my mother and, you know, I think it's important to recognize when we're dealing with adult children, that your adult children also can make choices to like not speak to you or not open up to you or not believe you or not, you know, continue on a journey with you. Um, just as you have a choice. So I really liked, I think Karen, maybe a couple of you, um, said the importance of making sure that just the door is open. So just making sure that the doors are making sure that, and not just like the door is open, you know, the door is open, but they also have to know that the door is open. So you have to, at some point communicate through text, if they're not talking to you or through, you know, through a phone call, if maybe they're not being so, open with you like hey yes i screwed up yes divorce yes baby daddy is talking shit yes all the things and my door is open so that at least they know you know um my mom and i's relationship although my mom and i have always had a really good relationship i always haven't felt like i could tell my mom a lot of things not for any other reason other than just you know, shame or guilt. My mom's very religious. I'm not religious. So, um, but for me, you know, my mom didn't necessarily come to me and say like, Hey, my door is open. But what I did because of my learnings, because of the education that I have now in mental and emotional health and trauma and all that stuff, I took it upon myself to just test it and just see like, Hey, what happens if I tell her this one thing, how is she going to react? And it's been great. Like my, my mom is proving over and over and over again that like she is here and she, oh, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> she is here and she is available to me. But if your child doesn't, doesn't, is too scared to take that step or too scared to have that conversation, then it is our responsibility as a parent 
to um, to at least tell them like, hey, you have to remind them like, hey, the door is open. Hey, the door is open. And then as a child, so speaking to children, so speaking to all of you, and we all have parents, that if your parent has to come to you and said, hey, my door is open, it is our responsibility. So we now here know that. Like you can't unknow something that you know. Those of you that are listening live or on the replay, you now know that. And you as an adult have to take the responsibility to see, is the door open? And test the door to see if maybe that relationship that you've always wanted or that relationship that you um, desire is possible of being there. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You know, we're all, we all have our own um, ways of, of thinking and doing but I do think that testing it um, is something that's vital as an adult. Um, Sharman, I know had her, her hand up. Donita. Um, Sabrina, you had brought up a couple of things of like my situation. So my middle son, a second born, um, he, he was with me for most of his life. Um, he lived with me like full time rather than his dad. And then about a year and a half ago, he moved down and lived with his dad for a while. And then he came back for a couple months. And, and I didn't know, I didn't know that his dad was uh, telling him like all these things, like, like outrageous lies, but he's chosen to believe them. So he hasn't been speaking to me. And like, he, he literally just exploded and just said all this stuff. And, um, and I had reached out a couple of times because I was like, how, do I, how do I let him know the door's still open? kind of a thing and um he i'll get like an angry you know kind of response so i was like okay give him more time give him more time and he did reach out just to um recently just to send me like a like this new family needed child care i'm a nanny so like he had seen this this family searching for somebody like just just in case you knew and i was like oh my gosh that's, that's so positive you know like this is like the open door and we had chatted back and forth a little bit and i'm like but the reason he's not speaking to me is still there, you know, like, do you, do you just ignore it and go on and do like, I, I'm like stuck on, okay, okay. So this, the reason that he's decided to be angry at me and not speak to me anymore, that's just gone, you know, like, or do I bring it up? Like, I was really hurt about it. So, so like, how did, you know, whenever you you're dealing, it? that's a type of abuse, your ex, is abusing you right. through your child. So that's a type of abuse. And how is the best way to react to abuse? It is to be the person you know you are and not become the person that they're trying to make you out to be. And eventually, because I had this, my my dad was very is very narcissistic and I can't have anything to do with him anymore. Um, so my brothers had been told all of these lies, you know, I did she's such a terrible person, you know, and I have just had to live above reproach. It's, it's, and if you keep living that and you keep opening that door and you keep letting me know that you love me, because to me, the most important thing for a child, and if you guys were all latchkey kids from the eighties, then you totally understand what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, it, it, I didn't know I was loved. I didn't understand that. And even if they said it with their mouths, I didn't feel it because the job was more important and this is more important. They were too busy trying to make a better life for me <laughs> that I didn't see myself as the most important thing. And so that's something that I think our generation is trying so hard to do differently for for the next generations is let them know that they're loved, not to the point that they we're enabling them. But to let them know we're here, we're still learning, we're still growing, we've made mistakes, we're owning up to it, we're apologizing, like our parents probably never did, and their parents definitely didn't, because that generation never apologized for anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Um, so, you know, be you. Continue to be you. Continue to let him see you be you. And it'll eventually come out. Somebody is going to come along and say, oh, your mom is the nicest, sweetest person I have ever known. Mm -hmm. And the truth will come out. Brenda, did you have anything? 
Um, probably. No, I'm just <laughs> I just wanted to say that I think that as parents, and I'm just going to try and take a second to formulate my thoughts. I've got a lot of things running through my head from all of this incredible conversation, but I think as parents, our, our greatest struggle, or I should say our, I shouldn't assume, my greatest struggle is ha really working hard to have those open lines of communication. That That's what I've really tried to have the entire time since my daughter was such like five or six, have the book at the bed. If you can't speak it to me, write it in this journal and then I'll write it back and then we'll have a conversation. We always tried to have these open lines of communication. And then I think my biggest struggle right now as she's adulting is that because our communication is so strong, sometimes she reacts to me more like I'm the friend. And I'm like, did you just speak to me that way? <laughs> Did you just, did you maybe just forget that I'm actually mom? <laughs> so I think that. Well, she's 15 um, or 16 or whatever she is. She's still. Oh, she's 20 now. Back. She's 20. <laughs> okay. I have allowed my oldest to kiss me before. I, I just, you know, we're past the point of respect. I don't always act respectful. So I don't expect them to always treat me that way. And yeah, you have to just kind of step back and say, okay, that's that's the communication that I've laid out. I love that Karen just let hers just lay into her. I think, you know, how many times would it have been nice if I could have laid into my mother? She was six foot tall and, and built like she was, so I was very intimidated. And she was a hippie. And so, you know, you just you didn't do that. You just didn't do that. But, you know, how many times would have, I have liked to have just given her a piece of my mind? And, you know, she probably would have been grateful had I just got it off my chest, too. So, yeah, I love that. Marie? Gosh, Charmin, everything you're going through, I've been through. I just feel like, oh my gosh, I feel like the big sister. Like, I want to just hug you and, and bring you along. I had the same exact situation with my kid's dad. He was so disrespectful of women. I was always looked at as second class. Obviously, he was physically abusive, mentally, and other ways. And I was so worried how he would influence my son to be this little disrespectful mini him. And through those years, he would tell him terrible things about me or just speak bad, speak negatively and disrespectfully. And I remember having to say to my son, and this is what you can say to your son, I understand you've heard one side of the story and whenever you're ready, we can sit down and you can hear the other side as well. And I'm willing to sit down and share that with you and be vulnerable. But I need to have that opportunity to have my say as well and, and not be judged by one side of it. And I'm going to tell you that, Charmin, that I, I want to keep giving you this light at the end of the tunnel because my son respects me and he respects his girlfriend. He is like so respectful and protective of women. And he now, he's got a, a relationship with his dad, barely. And he'll say, well, that's just like a hanging out, going shooting and working on cars, buddy, mom. It's not you. And so they see the truth. That's the beauty of it. Whether it's at 18 or whether it's at 30, they all eventually get that emotional intelligence level where they're like, oh, wait, I can make out the truth here. I can weigh this out and figure this out. And all three of my kids saw him for what he was because I did not speak negative. I refused to speak negative because we all had to go through divorce parenting classes and they said, when you speak negative of their father, you're speaking negative of 50% of them. Yep. So I determined I would never speak negative of their father. Yep. All I could do is do my part, be the best mom I could and instill those qualities in them that later on would benefit, even though you're in the, you're in the muck, you're in the weeds right now, Charmin, because 
they're so influenced by that male role model they're tending to go with what he says but i trust me you show them unconditional love and you offer anytime you want to talk we'll sit down and i'll tell you my side of it and then you can make up your mind you know his side her side the truth then you can decide what you think but i need to have a fair share in speaking my truth as well <clears throat> I, I actually, thank you, Johnny. Sorry. Um, I, I totally agree with that, Maureen. And I love that um, the way that you're putting it as far as I'm not going to sit here and just tell you short little spurts of like, Mah. you're like, if you ever want to sit down and hear the whole thing, I just think that that's so beautiful because I think sometimes we can get, my son does that too um with with that he's 18 he still loves me so it's not like this whole thing but his dad has said stuff and he's come back to me and be like my dad says it differently and the only thing i've said so far is just well there's always two sides and that's all i've left it at i haven't gone as far as what you're saying because there isn't really any issue at the moment but um i love that because that's good for me to know preemptively you know if it ever comes to that point but that's so powerful it's like i'm not going to waste my time defending this one little thing that you're right here arguing with me about what I'm going to do is if you ever want to take the time to sit down with me, we can have a whole conversation. And I think that's beautiful because that'll give them the whole picture of everything. And I think it's also very important. My fiance is dealing with this with his kids. His kids live predominantly with their mother. She bad talks him sometimes. And there's a lot of back and forth on that. And my whole thing that I always tell his children is you have the choice because there's always two sides and then there's always the truth. I mean, that's just how it is. And, and I know that I tell my fiance that all the time. And he's like, why do they blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, obviously your side, you're painting it differently than the way she's painting your side. And you're going to paint your side as good as possible. That's just normal. But you have to give your children. And I tell his children this, you have to give yourself the ability to choose who you decide. Just know that both of your parents love you unconditionally. Um, they love you so much. And it really doesn't matter because sometimes they'll come to me and they'll be like, you know, I don't know, you know, and they'll be sad, like who's, who's right. And why did it happen? Whatever. It's like, it doesn't really matter why it happened. And you can also choose to believe whoever you want to believe. Um, but in the end, just know that they both love you and they're both here for you and you can come to them whenever they want, uh, whenever you need them. And, um, and that's really all you need. The story behind it doesn't really matter. I hope that helps. <laughs> the communication, I think everything that we've talked about has come back around to communication. You know, whenever I watch a movie with uh, our children, even to this day, and they've just learned it so well, we kind of pick the movie apart. You know, the relationships that are going on, the circumstances that are happening. Um, you know, how could the circumstance be handled a little differently? I, I think it's so important to be able to analyze those types of things with them. That's a safe place. If it's, you know, characters in a book or characters in a movie, that's a safe place to say, you know, look how this situation is. How could it be handled differently? Because then they will turn around and they will apply those principles in their life and, and they will start seeing things in their life. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I really, my heart goes out to you and, but it's never too late. I, I think that's just so important for people to understand is it's never too late, no matter what your children are doing, no matter how bad it might be, um, you know, love them through it. it it's, it's, it's never too late to show them that you love them and, and, yeah. Thank you so much, Donita. I appreciate that. This was phenomenal. Um, I took a whole page of notes. So thank you so much for all of your awesome input and storytelling and, and giving of advice. I so appreciate all of you being here and taking some time out of your Saturday morning. I know some of you are up very early to hang out with us here. I love these impact panels. To me, they're just everything. I look forward to just having real in-depth conversations once a month with just females um, 
that that just are on the same page and going through the same stuff. And it, at one at one side, it's so humbling, and on the other side, it really makes me feel as if I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one dealing with this. Sometimes you can feel like, oh my gosh, my, it's just a mess over here. It's just a mess all the time. <laughs> and when you sit down with these beautiful women, you recognize like, hey, listen, yes, I did that too. Or yes, I am right now uh, dealing with that. And it just really warms my heart to know that, you know, we're not alone. And, you know, there is women out there who are are more than open and willing to share some of their stuff and share some of their um, experiences in order to help us, in order to inspire us, in order to teach us. And I think that that's so important. And that's what the Her Version platform is really based on. It's just, we're all here for each other. And um, it's just all about, you know, sharing that, sharing that. That's what's so important. So thank you to every single one of you. For those of you um, watching live, there's 49 people watching live right now. We got to a high of 65. So thank you so much for everyone that was here watching live. If you do catch us on the replay, make sure you hashtag replay so that you know, we know where you are. We can send you some love for those of you. Um, Oh yeah, listening live. Thank you for supporting us. We can all use some perspective in this arena. So I encourage you to share this podcast right now and comment where you are from. Also, this is an inter oop, I'm reading my I'm reading my intro. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for joining us here. I'm having some issues with my script today. Oh my. Thank you so much for joining us here on her version. I hope you received some helpful information on parents with adult children and how to navigate through it. This is all advice for Maureen, by the way. So she <laughs> Maureen's starting her own podcast. So if any of you are interested in being on a podcast, contact Miss Maureen over here. Um, this is me helping her recognize sometimes. Authentic technical yes, girl. problems. It's okay. I'm owning it. You're owning uh, it. I love, I love you. It. My <laughs> intro and my outro, just a mess. I hope you received some helpful information on parents with adult children and how to navigate it. The content here was amazing. I learned so much and I hope you did too. These women, along with others, take time every month to open up about parts of their lives in order to educate and inspire the world to think differently. If you resonate with any of these ladies, please follow and reach out to them. Their information is in the ticker at the bottom of the screen and in the description of the video you are watching. So all you do have to do is just scroll back and forth when your person was talking, check to see the name tag under their um, their screen, match it up with the ticker at the bottom, screenshot, and find that person. If I, if you have an amazing story to share of struggle to triumph, be sure to reach out to me here or at herversion.life. I am your host, Sabrina Victoria, and I'm so grateful to be here sharing a platform that allows people to share their truth and inspire others. As always, do something awesome today. Much